talk's going to be the intro to container security uh, in regards to Kubernetes, mostly within um, Kubernetes. <sighs> well, actually, before I do that, let me just get a I just want to, real quick, I, I always hate when speakers do this, but a show of hands if anybody has any experience with uh, Docker and Kubernetes at all in the room. Okay, how about just Docker in itself? Okay. All right, so um, I'll try to get through all of these slides. I have a lot. I am really horrible at making presentations, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, so it's a little bit about me. Like, um, I'm an infrastructure architect. Like, I don't really use Visio <laughs> as an inside joke with my coworkers. I'm really horrible at pictures and anything that looks like nice on presentations. I'm really bad at. Uh, I've you know, worn many hats in my career and I've done a few different things within this world. Um, you know, that's my tone dial from back in the day, if anybody remembers what that thing is. It's you know, gotten really into uh, stuff. <laughs> um, my first DEF CON I ever went to was DEF CON 9, so back in the day, Lexus Park. Um, it's a lot of fun back then. Uh, so this is, and, you know, I read a lot of tools. Uh, one in particular that gained some popularity was QPS1, this one right here. Um, so if you ever, you know, running Kubernetes and you need to uh, check out the context and namespace you're in when you're on the command line, it's a really good utility for managing that. So give it a, you know, give it a uh, look if you ever want to. And I'm also a big metalhead, so if anyone wants to talk to you about stuff on the computers, you know, that's, that's a good place to start. Um, all right, so this will be my agenda. I'm just going to go over, I'm going to do a little brief history lesson on containers. Um, I like to do the history uh, briefly just because that's that's how I learn. Like, I always go back to the history of everything to see where it came from and how it was designed and why it works the way it does so I understand all the different abstract, abstractions uh, a little more clear. And then I'm going to discuss a couple of the potential attack vectors uh, whenever you know, that you face in the container world, especially within Kubernetes. Um, I'm going to talk about the different parts that make up Kubernetes and they can, uh, go into details about the control plane, worker nodes, and then the specific workloads within them. And then we'll go into auditing and logging and then just some suggestions, best practices on securing your cluster, different things there. All right. Everybody know who those guys are? That's <laughs> Randy. And Brian Kernan. And back of Unix guys right there. Guys have invented Unix. I love that picture. Um, it's a brief, brief history of the container universe. So they're not really new. Like they get like that whole reputation of like the cool kid thing, and like you know all of us with our stickers on our laptops, like they have you know the Docker stickers and everything. But they've been around for the technology has been around for quite a while, right? Like most of the stuff in computer science was done, and a lot of the stuff in computer science was pretty much done in the seventies, and we just abstract the crap out of it for the last like thirty years or so. Um, you know, in 1982, they had the, the Chirrut system call, and that's when it really started. And it was just isolation on the file systems. Um, they, later, they later in time became known as jails, and, and actually in the code now, it's actually referenced as jails in the uh, BSD code, if you go look within there, and the C code is, has that listed. Um, and then a whole bunch of years later, Solaris created zones. That was, that was the first commercial usage, really, of, of this type of isolation in the wild. Um, a little bit after that was that OpenVZ project. It didn't really gain much traction because it was rather complex, a little, little tough to use. And then in 2006 and 7 is when everything changed because process containers were created. Um, Google at the time uh, was looking for ways to condense and uh, really maximize the utilization within their data centers. And they saw these control or these con con uh, process containers being created. Um, so they went and hired all the kernel developers that were uh, designing these and created their own internal cluster scheduler called the work that I'll get into later. And that's that's basically what Kubernetes is based off of. But a lot of this research, a lot of the technologies that are in place right now are um, based off of years' experience inside of Google and how they run containers at scale. Um, and then, as you can see, C groups were merged into 2624. Control process containers were later renamed to control. 
Um, 2008 LXC was released, Linux containers. I think some people probably still use LXC, but it's it, it, it's a good implementation of namespaces and C groups, but it's not as fancy or as uh, user friendly as Docker. And that's what made Docker so powerful was you were able to take a command line that was like probably 30 arguments long uh, that was necessary to create a container and just shrink it down to Docker run. <laughs> And that just abstracted everything out and made it so easy to run containers, and hence the popularity and the growth that we've experienced since then. Is there a, for LXC? I haven't played with LXC. Is there like a is there like a Docker hub for LXC? Because that's probably one of the other big things for Docker. Was it the LXD? Something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I just like touched on LX. I, I looked at LXC a little bit when I was doing the research, but I didn't uh, go into much detail. But that's why I use Docker. So yeah. Right, like I think my Docker's popularity it really came from the ease of use. Like, because if you look at the like the first implementation was written in Python, and if you reverse engineer that code, you can see like the system calls that are being made, and, and they're they're big, right? Like you have like end center and then all the different C group stuff that that is necessary to create the isolation, and it's just all taken away from that. You know, There's such simple commands. I was going to do a demo of that, but. Um, I, I have like 39 slides. <laughs> um, so this is another history lesson here. Uh, so Borg is the cluster scheduler that's internal to Google. Um, and Omega was the one that came after Borg internally. And then both of those were um, pretty much merged into Kubernetes, as you can see here. Um, so Kubernetes is an open source version of what Google did and currently does internally in their data centers. Every single thing inside the Googleplex, like absolutely everything, no joke when I say everything, runs inside of a container in Google. When you go to Gmail or you create a Google Doc, Borg will spin up what they call an ALEC, which is the same thing as a uh, Docker container, and you will get your little instance and you'll be able to add it in Gmail. And um, they don't give out a lot of detail about it, obviously, but there are many good papers. That link at the bottom there um, is an excellent paper about Borg. It's like Google releases white papers all the time. It's like a 30-page, I believe, 30 or 30-something 30 page paper written by the engineers that um, designed Borg. And um, just like, I don't even know how many technologies are out there now, and as soon as that white paper gets released, usually a technology comes after it, after it and then it gets adopted. Like, Cassandra, the same thing happened with it. A few uh, other uh, technologies respond that way. But the difference here is Kubernetes was actually built by Google engineers and then released open source into the wild. And it was the number two open source project at, um, in popularity ever. It had the most commits, the mo it had something like 75 years of human development time. <laughs> within like the first two years of it being released, which is impressive. You know, I think the only other project that could bypass that would probably be the Linux kernel. Um, all right, so for the uninitiated, what is a container, right? So you always hear this word all the time. It's basically, it's just a stripped down version of the Linux operating system. Um, a lot of people call it OS virtualization, OS level virtualization, um, but it basically just uses the host kernel system calls. That's all it does. Um, it's not a VM, it's not um, an entire system, it's just encapsulation for a single process, just one process. So Tomcat, as an example, runs as a single Java process, right? So you have Java, Dash, whatever, run Tomcat, and that gets wrapped around um, and allocated a certain amount of memory and access to the file system. That's all a container is. It's not really there's a, there's a really popular engineer, Jesse Frizzell, she always says like a container is not a real thing. It's just a bunch of system calls wrapped around a process. And that's, that's basically all a container really is. There's like three main technologies that drive a, um, the whole container world. Seagroups, namespaces, and the union file system that's built underneath it. Um, if anybody wants to talk about the technologies of, of Docker and everything, I can later. I can talk for hours about this stuff. But um, they're not these extremely crazy complex entities. It's just wrapping resource uh, constraints around um, single process. 
uh, to see here, the difference between a virtual machine and a container. Uh, with, the, with the virtual machine, you have your infrastructure, then you have your host OS, like whatever it may be, and then your hypervisor, ESXi, AHV, KVM, any of those hypervisors, and then you build your OSs on top of it traditionally, and then you launch all of your, you know, your libraries, your binaries, everything you need for your applications to be able to serve traffic and to be available to customers, right? In the container world, it's a little bit different than that. That's not necessary for any of that compute. You have your infrastructure, your OS, and then this picture is a little dated. That has the Docker engine. You can replace that pretty much with any um, container API because Docker is not the only one anymore. In fact, Docker is actually more of an ecosystem nowadays than it is um, uh, the container runtime. The container runtime itself is now also abstracted out of Docker. Docker is like a full tool suite. And um, this, the blue layer that says Docker Engine just be the container API. Um, so basically, I like this image because it just has like the old way versus the new way. You know, like in the old way, we would deploy virtual machines all the time. Um, everything we need, you know, we're sitting there worrying about YAM updates and app gets and everything, trying to keep our applications up to date. SSL vulnerabilities, you have to like deploy however many updates to however many nodes. Um, and man manage those operating systems and everything that they're doing. And then with the new way with containers, you don't have to do that at all. Like you maintain your fleet of machines and that's all. And your applications sit on top of that, self-contained, movable, um, destroyable and reproducible within seconds as opposed to bo booting up entire VMs or entire operating systems all the time. You always hear people say containers are super fast to boot up that's, that's, it's, a, it's weird to say that because they don't boot, like it's actually just like, it's a process execution. So that's why they boot fast because it's just, it's like typing top and hitting enter. That's like essentially all that it does when you run a container. <laughs> I talk fast, jeez. That's why I have 38 slides. Um, <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> before I get into all of the intricacies of Kubernetes, I'm gonna go over a little bit of the, um, a couple of the attack vectors, some of the popular attacks um, and vulnerabilities that have existed in, the, in Kubernetes. Um, these aren't Docker specific, these are gonna be Kubernetes specific um, attacks. Um, and these are the main ones here. Uh, some of them are easy to configure, some of them are pretty complex, you know, but the main ones are gonna be container compromise, obviously, because the container runs on the host. If you compromise the container and you have access within it, you can sometimes uh, escalate and get host access. Um, another one is unauthorized access between pods. I'll describe what pods are later, uh, just but real quick so it might make a little more sense. Pods are just a collection of containers, that's all. It's just one or more containers. It's another layer of abstraction Kubernetes adds. It's just <laughs> everything is everything in this world is just abstractions. Um, data exfiltration, of course, you know. Uh, misconfiguration, I was going to put like another pseudo meme on here, but I'm not doing it. Um, misconfiguration is always like, you know, a thorn in our side because you could give somebody access to a system with pseudo thinking you're preventing certain attacks from happening or securing your system, but actually makes it worse if it's not configured correctly. Same thing can happen here. <clears throat> if the systems aren't configured correctly, um, you can actually open up bigger holes than you would if you didn't even use some of the primitives. And then direct access to the host. Uh, so, like, it's always a good idea to have your like bastion hosts or your jump boxes. You know, um, in this world, it's pretty important because you don't want to give access out. You know, keys of the kingdom to the host, to the cluster itself. You know, that old like, you know, you don't, you shouldn't have to SSH into every machine to take a look at it. Like, really applies in this world because um, if you have access to a worker node in the in the Kubernetes cluster you have access to all of the containers running. So if you have root on that machine, you'll be able to see absolutely everything that's going on on all those containers. Okay, these are the two most damaging ones, I think, in recent times, these two CVEs. Um, the first one uh, basically allowed rewrite behavior uh, with files that were specified within the pod, even the host file system. So the, an attacker could just be inside of a container and have complete access to the host and do anything they want with it. And they've since fixed that. 
uh, by just changing the way that the subpath uh, works inside of Kubernetes. There's a link at the bottom there that describes this attack in detail. I should reproduce it because there's no exploits for it. It's like it's just a series of commands. I think there's no, you know, there's nothing necessary to exploit these other than like doing some sim links. Uh, so they're they're pretty damaging, but um, if configured correctly, they're they're easy to avoid. Um, the second one was ridiculous because you could just sim link arbitrary files within like your container and then delete things on the host. <laughs> so, you know, you can like simulate Etsy Shadow into your temp directory, and then you can just take a look at it. Um, that has since been fixed. That link is at the bottom. All these are very reproducible. If you run uh, like a mini cube or anything locally, you can try the attacks out. Just pin pin your uh, vault um, versions like one eight and below of Kubernetes, and you can like perform both of these attacks in ten minutes probably. Anybody remember this attack at all? Sorry about anybody. Tesla. They got hacked really bad because their Kubernetes dashboard was left in unsecure, no password access whatsoever. And back before Kubernetes 1.8, the dashboard had super user access to the cluster, and because of that, they had their AWS access tokens. So the attackers started using Tesla's infrastructure in AWS to uh, mine Bitcoin. <laughs> It was pretty bad. <laughs> um, I think I have a link at the end of this for this, but just Google like the Tesla Tesla hack. It was ridiculous, like how easy it was. You didn't really even have to hack the thing. You just went to that URL and there it was. And you can see on the um, on the side where the workloads are over here, uh, you had access to absolutely everything. So. I'll get into that a little bit later on how to keep this secure, but this has changed drastically. The dashboard no longer has um, unrestricted access into the cluster like it used to. Thank you to Tesla for that. <laughs> All right, Kubernetes. Um, I like memes, I'm cheesy with memes, but this guy makes me laugh every time. Um, so I guess say because like Kubernetes is pretty complex, you know. There's a lot of moving parts within Kubernetes, and it can sometimes be daunting. But if, if you look at it um, layer by layer, I guess you would say, it, it's not as complex as it, as, as it might appear. It's basically a container orchestrator. It takes Docker, apply it to many different hosts, and you can cluster it. It's completely API-driven, which is like, it's very, very nice because you can have large-scale distributed computing with an API. Um, it's completely open source and can scale huge. It, it's, it's a very robust system. Um, there's unbelievable amounts of documentation out there on how to use Kubernetes, how to deploy Kubernetes. Um, so it's not as you know, it's not as bad as what what some people might think it is. You know, if if, if you really want to learn the details of it, there's a Kubernetes the hard way, which is a pretty good exercise to go through. I did that before uh, to learn the different components. Um, you basically get to operate containers at scale. If anybody has run Docker, even Docker locally, it starts, to, you know, a few Docker images on your hosts, not bad, right? Like you can have a couple ports open, you can do some port forwarding, or you can front it with uh, some load balancers to get to those backend services. But once you start scaling that out, you have 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 containers, it gets a little bit uh, hard to manage due to the ports. Um, Kubernetes takes care of that. Um, every single um, unit of compute within Kubernetes gets assigned individual IP addresses. So you can have all of your applications running on the same set of standard ports as they do within um, virtual machines or bare metal. You know, you can have port, you can have your application run on port 80 instead of you know 8080, 8081, 8082, because you have 45,000 time apps. Um, yeah, that's why I put the other me about that, because that's the architecture of Kubernetes. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, so I'm going to go over all these components and how, they, and how each of those can be secured and what um, primitives are offered by Kubernetes to keep each of these components secure. But the main, the main ones, like, so over on the, uh, my right is the UI that I just mentioned that was completely left open by Tesla and how the UI interfaces with the API server. And the API server directly talks to the masters, and then the master is just the brain of Kubernetes that you interface with for everything, and he talks to all the workers. 
I'm going to describe the masters, the worker nodes, uh, things to do um, with those to keep them secure and to lock them down and configure them correctly, and then and also the workloads that are deployed out on there. So Kubernetes offers a ton of primitives that are built into the system um, for their security. Um, there is, I, I don't mention anything in this talk of third-party tools. Everything that's in this talk is all native to the environment and all native to, to this world. Um, I, I do mention like some applications to automate the testing, but other than that, I mean, there's no products or anything mentioned in here because they 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 offer so much to, um, in their API to keep this thing so, keep it nice and secure. Yeah. So the brand of Kubernetes, the control plane, that's the main part of the master server they call the master slave relationship um, terminology they use. This is usually just called the, the master, but it's the control plane. And it runs um, these components. You know, it's usually four components, but five if you run in the cloud. But then you have the cloud controller manager, which is a nice, um, that's a nice service because if you're running an AWS or GKE or any other cloud provider, that cloud controller manager has hooks directly into those APIs. So if you spin up a service and you need a load balancer, that cloud controller manager will handle that for you and actually talk to the APIs and deploy the load balancers or any of the other service type features for you um, automated, which is very nice. Um, NCD is the key value store that is used for all of the data. It's um, a consensus um, cluster system, so it, it holds absolutely everything necessary to keep this cluster running. I talk about it a little bit later on how to keep that secure because there's a lot of uh, sensitive information that's in there that's, that, that has absolutely everything that the cluster needs is within that CD. All right, that's really fuzzy, huh? Yeah. All right. I'm bad at pictures, I told you. All right, the Kubernetes worker nodes. So on each of your worker nodes in your environment, you have these three components that run on it. You have a kubelet, a kube proxy, and then your container runtime. I said before, the Docker is basically like an ecosystem now. It's not really um, just for containers, right? The container runtime is an abstracted um, daemon that talks to whatever container API you want to use. So if you have um, OpenShift clusters, you can use Red Hat's, oh, uh, I think it's, what is it, the OCI or whatever. The, they have their own um, cluster, or I mean, uh, container API. There's run C, which is the default within Docker. There's container D, which is now the default within Kubernetes. If you deploy Kubernetes like in GKE, you'll get what's called container D. And none of these have Docker on um, because Docker's too heavy now because there's too many components. And when you run your container cluster, you don't really need Docker because when you're running a container, you don't need to do a Docker build. You know, you'll do that on build machines. Um, so they don't have that anymore deployed in the clusters. There's a nice little thin layer that just has the few, um, the few CRUD calls that are necessary, like create your container, destroy your container, pull down the image, um, update the image, and delete the image. I think those are like pretty much the only API calls that are necessary for that container runtime to take place. So, any questions about that? Because that could probably get a little bit confusing because Docker is always the main thing talked about. and I mean, it, it, you can run Docker in here, but it's just not necessary because it's just such a heavy API now, and it's, it has so much tooling. Like, there's also Docker Swarm, which is a cluster scheduler, but um, when you deploy Docker, you get Docker Swarm. So you, you have all these components running within your cluster that you don't need. So that's why they came up with this nice container runtime uh, to be able to abstract that away. They've actually done that in every component in this ecosystem. They've abstracted everything out put an API layer on top of it so you, so you can design your own. The network layer has it. You can run whatever virtualized network stack you want within Kubernetes. There's Cisco makes one. Um, there's Open vSwitch. Everything is pretty nice and abstracted. It's, it's, it's very, uh, very nice because it can run anywhere. Also, to kind of uh, further add to this subject, didn't like the company behind Docker also kind of change the name from like the Docker engine to Container D? Right, I thought there's a, like a bit of a name change going on as well. Uh, well, Do Docker they changed their entire 
ecosystem, and they, they call it like the build for it all is like Modi. Uh -huh. And then container D, they just that's just the name of the binary mm -hmm. that interfaces with the kernel. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it was at one point Docker D. Mm -hmm. There are Docker Engine, Docker D, and now there's Container D, but that's not Container D. I'm not sure if it's either Container D or Run C that's the default that's provided with Docker. Mm -hmm. It's one of the two, but those are just that's just the actual API layer that talks to the kernel. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So those are the main components, and then the first thing to talk about within keeping this thing secure is our back, right? Role-based access control. Uh, starting with Kubernetes 1.6, they started adding RBAC in, um, enabled by default. Um, and also, with that, you get a deny by default. <laughs> so, if you, back when Kubernetes 1.6 first came out, uh, we got, people got bit by it because they would deploy their cluster, be like, oh, 1.6 came out, let's update, you know, an update from 1.5 to 1.6, and all of a sudden, nothing worked. Um, because everything was, in, everything was in a deny. So, you had to start enabling um, every single piece of communication, excuse me, within the cluster that you wanted to have. The RBAC has rules that apply to users. Um, they have, it gives permissions that they can perform within the API server. And then you have the cluster rules, which are cluster-wise. So rules apply to specific sets of resources within the cluster, and cluster rules apply globally to the cluster. There's a little picture there to help clarify a little bit because sometimes, like even at work, we sometimes have to write this on the whiteboard because it gets a little confusing. We're like, wait, is it a role binding? Is it a role? Is it a cluster role? So I like, write them down every time, like truth charts on the whiteboard before we start like figuring, like, oh, we need to add this role binding, and then I break everything and stay off the four or five morning. You can see that the you know a role applies to the resource, a role binding applies to the role, and behind that is the entity. All right, workloads. I love that picture. <laughs> oh my. What is it you say you do here? So, a pod. That's basically, it's an old picture because it has the word Docker in there, but you can replace that with container engine. Um, it's basically pods are collections of containers. Uh, deep dive into a pod, and you'll see that there is a single container running in there called the pods container. It just runs a system call called pods. So if you're ever on a container cluster and you do a Docker PS, there's always this word pods everywhere. That's just a not that's a container that adds a layer of abstraction on top of containers to provide the ability to have multiple containers within one. So that's like a little bit of like inception, but um, <laughs> basically um, you can have shared namespaces within Docker. Like you can you can share namespaces, so that's all that a pod does is it has a shared namespace and attaches other containers to that shared namespace, and it does that with the pods container, and then has the ability to schedule and do everything as singular units. So a pod you can think of as basically like your application stack. So like the pod can be located or the containers that are in the pod can be located wherever they need to be. So if it's a lamp stack. You can have your Apache process, your MySQL process, and your PHP stuff running all within one pod. And that will be three different containers, but they're all abstracted and ran as a pod. And what you get with this is you get a single API assigned, or a single IP assigned to each of these, instead of having three individual containers, port forwarding added, and all kinds of different rules. This abstracts that away and creates like nice little cohesive units that can now be moved all over the place within the cluster. That came out of that idea came out of Google because they they obviously have a lot of computers and um, they could not do the port translation stuff like to manage like 400 ports on one computer. So they decided that this was a better model by assigning every single unit a an IP address. All right. So now, pod level security. So there's a lot of stuff you could do at the pod level. Um, you can limit um, everything that the pod does. So you can tell it that it, it can only you know, get and list, and it's all API verb actions. So everything that the pod can do, you can restrict and limit access to. 
Uh, the pod reader rule and the roll binding, like I was describing before, this has a roll binding uh, pod reader. So if you go back here, so the roll binding applies to that entity, which is um, the user or the group, and then that applies to the pod reader rule, which gets assigned to the pod. And then it is allowed to do what you tell it you want it to do. So you can, you can say that, this, that the containers within this pod, they're only allowed to do you know, X, Y, and Z, and do not let it do anything else. It's, just, it's, it's actually quite simple. There's a lot, like I said, there's a lot. These are all the available contexts that you can add to a pod. I wasn't gonna go through all of these because it's like, you know, it's like I'm like giving a lecture. But there's a lot. You can even add node level contexts within your pods, like SE Linux, SecCom, um, App Armor, and capabilities. You could also use those and put those um, primitives into your pod to be able to limit what it does. Like right here, so you get SE Linux and capabilities, App Armor, and SecCom. I'm sure everybody's you know vaguely familiar with that. We've seen how to run you know set force to zero. Um, but they're really nice. Like if you apply these at the pod level, uh, they get very powerful and can really help with keeping whatever workload you have inside really secure. Um, so this is the uh, this is an example of the, a pod definition within Kubernetes. Um, so I just have the security context B size right there on line four, um, and that gets applied to this. So there's the spec that just says run as this user one thousand has to be. Uh, it has to be a number, cannot be a string for the user. Um, I'm telling it I only want to read only file system because this is just a process running. I don't need to write data in this in this guy. So you know, if somebody were to um, privilege escalate within this container, they won't be able to do anything. You know, you can't touch anything on the file system. You can't make any modifications whatsoever. And you're also denying privilege escalation. So you have like two layers right there. So you're not running as root. You're not allowing anything to happen on the file system. And privilege escalation is not available, so you can't give it anything extra once you're inside of that container. That's just three examples of these guys all being applied to that particular pod. There's a lot more that you can add, like I said, with the SE Linux and uh, privileges, or I mean capabilities rather, and SecComp and other different things. This is a new topic. I just wanted to touch on it, like. Briefly, um, this is one that's getting pretty popular though within this world. It's like the idea of sandboxed pods. Um, there's two projects out there right now. Um, one of them is Google's GVisor, and the other is called Cata Containers. Um, it basically just provides like a whole another layer of isolation, right? So, like I said before, more abstraction. So, in between the kernel, you know, you have your container engine. And then after the container engine, you're going to have your applications running and all your system calls are happening. So with these sandbox pods, you're actually going to move that up another layer, put it into user space, provide a shim in between everything, and then have that layer of isolation. So it, it's actually quite nice. Like I ran GVisor uh, locally for a while. Um, there's like really no changes. It's a slimmed down, really, 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 really small Linux kernel that only has the system calls necessary for containers to run. So, I mean, there's like 340, I believe, system calls in the kernel 4. Uh, you know, the container doesn't need that. The container of God does not need those, all those system calls. You know, it needs like 12. So the GVisor is just a slimmed down kernel that, that only gives you access to those. Same thing with, um, with the CATA containers. It just adds that little shim in there. Um, it gives you the, the runtime for CATA on top of the container runtime. And it's, it's pretty nice because you get like really hardcore isolation. So if you were to break out of any of the workloads and get access into the container, you're going to access system, a system level kernel or a user level kernel that can't do anything except maybe like start your container back up. So it's not really damaging at all yet. <laughs> all right, so the next big piece is the network policies. This gets really like very granular, and there's a lot. I can talk about network policies probably for an hour. Um, this is just one example right here. Uh, it's basically you're going to specify what a pod can do at, at every single layer uh, possible. So you can tell it that it can't talk to the other containers within 
the pod. You can tell it that it can only talk to one container in a pod over there. You can tell it not to talk to anything. You can get as granular as you want and as uh, secure and as open as you want. Um, there's a ton of policies out there that are already written and available. Ahmet, he's a uh, Google engineer, has this repo with these images. That is actually a GIF that moves. I'm horrible. I probably could have got that in there, but I'm not good at slides. But these like dots, they move. <laughs> um, you can see like it just says that in the default namespace in the middle, the Web app can talk to the DB, but nothing else can talk to it. So all the other applications that are running in your cluster, they can't even talk to it. You're limiting it, and that's it. Here's a little uh, pod spec that I wrote. Network policy, rather. This is the YAML that has the pod selector says, line eight, my application is called B-Sides Delaware. It's an API server, and I'm only going to allow ingress to that pod on any thing that I label with besides Delaware. So nothing else that's in the cluster, unless it has that label applied to it, can talk to this. And that's, that's basically how it works. Those rules that are on uh, from five down just define exactly how the uh, network policies work. Um, you can create these at the namespace. You can create them at the pod. Um, they can be globally scoped, and they can be locally scoped. All right, resource, resource quotas. It's another one. There's a ton of stuff. <laughs> so basically, like you, a resource quota just lets you know, or lets the cluster know how much compute you want to give a certain container. That's basically all it does. But it applies to everything. So it can apply to the CPU, and it's also the limits and the requests of the CPU. It can apply to the memory. You can apply it to a pod, a service, every single piece of the cluster. You can apply resource quotas to. And again, you can apply this to a whole namespace. You can apply it to all your pods if you want. You can apply it to one pod. So you can put the definition within your pod. So you know, like, so say an attacker gets a hold of your pod or your container, um, somehow breaks out of it, is able to log in to all the other containers within that pod, right? And you, he tries to DDoS or start Bitcoin mining or something. Um, this having these resource quotas in place will not allow it to be able to consume any resources extra that you tell it. So you could say like, you know, you could baseline your applications, find out exactly what they need, and then you could assign that to every single one of your applications in the cluster. So then you can maximize um, your cluster's footprint as much as you want, like by analyzing all this data, which is all available, by the way. So Kubernetes is, follows that ABC methodology, but always be collected. <laughs> it has every single metric. It's all collected all the time with it by the API server. There's an example of uh, a resource quota. I'm just telling it, um, I'm giving it 10 gig of memory, 500 millis, I believe, of CPU, which is like a half a, and it rates it like AWS, that's like a, like a half a gig. And then that's, I do that with the request, but then I limit it to that same amount, so it can't go any more than that as well. <clears throat> Basically, all that does, and that's applied to the pod. You can see number two, uh, line two. This is applied to the pod. All right, auditing and logging. There's three different styles of auditing and logging within the cluster. You get out of the box. You get basic logging. You know, follows the Docker um, back when they first started. Followed the 12-factor application model. So, um, you know, everything gets logged to standard out. Um, so this does the same thing. Everything gets logged standard out, but on top of that, you get the node level logging, which takes standard out, standard error, and applies that at the cluster level. So there's many different things you could do with logging in the Kubernetes world. You can log your single application if you want. You can log the entire cluster. You can log just one container if you want. It's, it's pretty much up to you the way you design it. Um, what I do and what we do at work um, in production, we, uh, we have daemon sets, they're called, which is just a container that, that runs on every node, and it logs and sends everything to Splunk. Um, so we just get all of our data collected all of the time and moved off the nodes. So if anything happens to them or if the container goes to another node, we still have all the logs. But like I said before, with how the abstraction happens for the container daemon, 
same thing happens here. So that's also abstracted, and you get a uh, logging API. So you can put whatever logging driver you want or you use in your enterprise uh, inside here. So you can use Splunk, you can use Elf, you can use Syslog. There's, I, I, I can't, last time I looked, I think there was like 15 or 20 of them available just right out of the box that you could start using um, to do all of your logging. It's all JSON, so a little insider tip if you, uh, it, it logs each message one line at a time. So keep that in mind if you have stack traces. Then there's this new guy out there called the Admission Controller. This is new as of, I think, 112 of Kubernetes, I believe. So this sits between the API server and um, the kubelet that is responsible for running your containers. And it can do even more um, security within your cluster. You know, you can tell it these are just some examples of the um, uh, control that is available, but it's customizable and extendable. You can put whatever you want in that admission controller to limit anything that goes on. So you can tell, like, always pull images instead of if the image is already pulled down on the node um, and you and the container dies, it has to come back up. You can tell the emission controller, all right, don't use the image stored on disk. Always pull it, no matter what. You know, that's just an example of uh, what this can do. Um, it can even do like rate rate limiting. It can deny escalating exec, which is pretty cool because we had developers at one point um, figure out that our robot accounts were able to uh, exec into the container, and they just would put all the logs in their Jenkins build logs. So like, if we're looking at like the build logs, like, oh man, look, there's <laughs> 25 pages of build logs right in here. And then we look, we're like, oh, the Jenkins account, uh, robot account is able to exec into the container, and they just told it to, you know, show us all the logs. So with things like this, you can tell it, like, yeah, I can't do that. You can also do that far back, but this makes it a little more granular. All right, tabs versus spaces. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to talk about workloads. Like, who doesn't love YAML, right? Like, the Kubernetes is a pretty awesome ecosystem, but, like, it might, it's just hard to wrap my head around the fact that there's like a large-scale distributed computing environment available that's completely written in YAML. Um, everything in this world is YAML. So like even if you define nodes in, in compute nodes and, and workloads within the cluster, that's even in YAML. Everything is YAML. It's translated to JSON, obviously, the API, but it's all defined in YAML. Um, but there's a lot of really good utilities out there, and you can statically analyze all your workloads. So, Basically, you know, as part of your pipeline, as part of your builds, throw some static analyzers in there, some uh, code, anything inside your pipeline that looks at the YAML, you know, tell it if it finds certain strings that don't allow this build to proceed. Um, it's, it's a pretty nice, sort of nice thing about having YAML. Um, the etcd cluster, talked about that at the beginning. Uh, how do you secure the etcd cluster? So basically, um, when Kubernetes is deployed, sometimes you can deploy etcd alongside of all of your worker nodes or the master nodes. Um, don't do that. Deploy the etcd cluster independent of that and keep an isolated firewall in between your workers, master, and the etcd nodes. Um, everything in etcd is stored clear text. So all that API traffic is pretty much clear text. So you want to encapsulate that with TLS. Don't let your search expire. Um, it's like an inside joke. It's terrible. Um, it's not funny. Uh, so you know, encrypt data at rest and use the primitives like I talked about before because there's some um, obfuscation that you could do. Like they have the, like the base 64 encoding of secrets, which you know, like the base 64 is very secure. Uh, but there's stuff you can do with um, etcd. Always make sure that you're running etcd v3. Use TLS, encrypt everything at rest. Limit direct host access. You know, same thing with um, using those jump hosts. So, like, nobody needs to log into etcd, but there's no need to log into those servers. Like, if, if, if the cluster is designed correctly and it's being administered um, properly, etcd doesn't really need much care and feeding, you know, just kind of like you can even run a Kubernetes job to do your backups. You won't ever have to touch etcd. If you're going to limit that, limit host access, 
All right, whew, three, fourteen. All right, suggestions, best practices. Um, obviously, you know, keep your keep your clusters updated. Kubernetes has a ridiculous uh, velocity of development. Like, if you go look at the change logs when they release one like one eight four to one nine zero, it's like nine pages of changes. Like, and, and some of those are really important. So make sure you read your change logs before you do the deployment of your updates. No yum update dash y. Um, TLS everywhere, obviously. Some you can deploy clusters if you want without TLS, but the Kubernetes API uh, has uh, a very easy TLS implementation. You know, you just uh, you can have a PKI built right built right in the cluster and use it to do your TLS. So you can just pass some flags to the kubelet, you have a secure cluster. Uh, use the CIS benchmarks. CIS benchmark, I think last time I checked for Kubernetes, is like 85 pages long. Um, it's, it's a boring, dry read, but there's this really cool utility by Aquasec called QBench. Um, you can run, it runs in a container, and it'll analyze your whole cluster, and, it, and it's the whole uh, utility is based off of the CIS benchmarks. So it'll just output all the stuff on how you score against the CIS benchmarks. It's pretty nice. And it just tells you, you know, you can see here it says, you know, privilege exec is failed because you didn't put it on there. So that's a very nice utility to use to get your cluster. You can check out best practices. You can help you secure it without even having to read much of the docs. Um, limit kubectl access. So kubectl is the command line utility that interfaces with the API. Uh, it's basically like SSH for this for the cluster, you know. Um, but lim limit the access to that because. Uh, you know, it's just like I said at the beginning, like sudo can be nice, but you know, sudo dash i with like no counting or anything else is not good. Um, so do this, keep the same thing in mind with kubectl. Make sure the access is restricted and everything, all those actions are logged. Obviously, automate container image builds. There, um, the cluster that we run in production does not have the Docker, full, the full Docker API running. Has a container D, so we can't even build images on the clusters if we wanted to. So we do all of our building outside of the cluster using um, build servers. You know, during that process, static analyzers are run, and they can analyze everything that's going on in there. Do integration testing. You can do any type of testing that's necessary to keep uh, the best practice followed within your organization, so you you know that what you're deploying is secure and not you know just some image from. Docker Hub that has a Bitcoin miner in it and obfuscated as you bump to 16. That happened actually. Um, don't run processes as root. Hardly anything needs root, right? Like even if you're running a web server in a traditional world, it has to run as root because it's ran below port 1024. In this world, you don't have to run um, anything on that port. You run a service that, that talks to port 80, but a different port on the back end, so all of your services can run as non-privileged users. I think we have like maybe one or two containers that run as root, and that's just, um, they have to in a way, but 90 something percent of all the images in our environment, none of them run as root, because it's just not necessary. Um, utilize the Kubernetes security primitives that I mentioned. There is a ton of them. The documentation is amazing. I was on SIG docs for a while, part of the Kubernetes project, helped working on the docs. There are so many docs out there and the Kubernetes docs are good. You don't have to Google, go to Medium or any of the other places. Like just go to Kubernetes.io. Like the docs there, they're absolutely phenomenal. Um, yeah, obviously do least privilege because um, because you can very easily in this world. You know, you can add a couple of lines of YAML that implements least privilege in your secure um, in your security configs are pretty good to go there. There's some resources. Kubernetes.io, the CI, uh, CIS benchmark uh, link. That's a good one. Um, CubeSec is good too. There's a lot of API stuff on that page to help you uh, figure out the way you want to secure it. A tool by Gareth, uh, he works at Docker, it's called KubeTest. All that does is it analyzes your YAML and it runs it through the API server and just says if your YAML is good enough. You know, maybe you missed something here or missed something there. That's a good utility. Uh, the audit to RBAC, I wish I had that last weekend. <laughs> I just found it during the research for this presentation. I think the RBAC will take all of your RBAC rules and, and draw you a nice picture of what it looks like, wow. which is 
God, I wish I had that last weekend. Um, and then the Aquasec security company, uh, they, they, they're, I think they're mostly like Docker and container security driven. It's a security vendor. That's free. It's just KubeBench, which just analyzes. It's the best practice analyzer. It's all dust. It just reads through. It doesn't make any changes. It just reads through all of your deployments and everything and tells you if you're following uh, CIS benchmarks. Um, the last link is the network policy recipes that are um, in GitHub. There's like 40 of them, I believe, last time I checked, that Amet has written. Um, it covers pretty much everything with really nice diagrams that show all the workflows and how everything communicates within the cluster, because it can get a little confusing at first. You know, but check that out if, um, if you want to implement network policies. Wow. All right. Thank you. Hope that wasn't too boring. If anybody has questions, I'll have, do I have time? Or? Uh, I'm not sure when this ends. Uh, Alright, 10 minutes if anybody has questions. Yep. So Docker is huge. How many of you work on maintaining it, keeping it up to date and secure uh, in the teams you work with? I mean, how many resources do you have to dedicate to people to do stuff correctly? To this environment? To, to Kubernetes. Oh, sorry, to Kubernetes in general, yeah. So we, we have four cluster admins, basically, full time. Uh, well, no, we don't full-time work on Kubernetes, but uh, there's, I think, four of us pretty much that care and feed the cluster. Um, it doesn't have that much care and feeding, actually, to be honest with you. Like, if, if it does, it's because there's operator error or misconfigurations. That's basically it. But other than that, it's pretty much, um, it, it, pretty, it does a root the scheduler within the environment does a very good job of managing itself. And the second question is that, for running jobs, do you, do you guys ask act as a kind of firewall and look over people's YAML, or do you let developers deploy their own applications? I mean, you said don't give access to cube, cube cuddle. Right, the developers do not, nobody gets cube cuddle. The only thing that has that is, is the build robots. Um, the developers are given, um, they can deploy pretty much whatever apps they want. Like, and and they are, it's all namespace and isolated, and they're resource constrained with the resource quotas like you saw here. Um, but we, we use what's called their Helm charts. I'm not sure if you ever heard of Helm, but we use Helm. So we have a definition of applications that are allowed to be deployed and vetted and tested. And then we have the Helm charts that are developed and they just they pull down the Helm charts. And for the developer, the only thing they have is a, is a pretty much a key value answer. So like they have a values file that just says, this version, this environment, this app. So you have predefined deployments and you can add all the security bits in the YAML. And the yep. Bit. Yeah. And a lot of it is like not up for questions. So a lot of it like there is abstract and they don't even know it's in place. Mm -hmm. And it just gets deployed into the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so did I get the architecture right that the um, SCD handles the secrets? So if you've got a, a runtime environment variable you need to set like AWS supports a runtime variable for getting mm -hmm. storage and like So how does that from an architecture perspective get set like managed in SED? Um, no, you still manage it within the YAML files like I, I showed earlier. So you'll have your definition of what um, what your deployment is and you can have your environment variables will be set in there. Right. But you can manage that as a secret and that gets stored in SED. SCD is the key value store. Yep. So you don't actually do much interfacing with SCD. SCD kind of just does its own thing on the back end. So you put a variable in there that ties to the storage key. Yes. It gets pulled down. It's just a that. pointer that says this is the secret, okay. and that's deployed in the cluster. And you can use whatever you want to manage those secrets, like HashiCorp's vault or any other storage mechanism. Any other questions? All right, thank you.